We are now officially into year two for Battlefield 5. On November 9th, 2018, the game released to Origin Access Premier subscribers, signalling the launch of the game, and I think it's fair to say that it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride for the game so far. Today, I am going to properly review the game once again, now that the game has been out for a considerable period of time, and of course we've had a live service worth of updates and fixes and patches and everything that's gone into the game, so it feels like kind of like a good time to, to review the game again. The product looks very different and it feels very different to a year ago, and since DICE is now offering a year two edition of the game, replacing the old deluxe edition, it's also clear that the development team wants people to think about Battlefield 5 a little bit differently, so let's see if things really have changed. First of all then, we'll start off with the single player. Battlefield 5 followed the same structure as Battlefield 1 single player, the war stories. These are shorter, snappier little sections of World War II told through the eyes of soldiers fighting, and most of them are fictitious stories. The game launched with just three different war stories to play, which was two less than the previous game in the franchise, but a fourth one was added not long after the launch, and that one was called The Last Tiger. And for me, it was the best of the lot. This war story stands on the other side of the conflict, the Axis powers, and you join a German tank crew in the final days of World War II as the Allies are pushing through Europe towards Berlin. During this story, the characters start to question whether the motives of their own country are really the right ones to be following, and this is all happening whilst they're increasingly cut off from the rest of the army and the troops who've been retreating. It's a much darker, grittier war story, and I think it strikes the tone that Battlefield 5 should have struck from the moment that it was revealed. This game did, and still does to an extent, have an identity crisis, and I don't think DICE genuinely had a unified, solid approach to this game during its development, and that led to a bit of a mishmash of ideas and constructs that pop up here and there throughout the game. And The Last Tiger is kind of one of those that feels a little bit out of place, considering the lighter tone to the rest of the launch package. When The Last Tiger was added, with that more serious attitude, it did feel a little bit odd when it was stood next to other war stories like Under No Flag, which tried to take things a little bit less seriously with some London accents and a bit of comedy. That said though, I think The Last Tiger stands out for the right reasons, because it set the tone that Battlefield 5 should have had from the start. However, overall, I'd say that perhaps Battlefield 5 could have done without the single player aspect. DICE focused quite heavily on the single player around the launch of the game in November last year, and I think that was actually to the detriment of all other aspects of the game, which I will now explain. One of those aspects that took a particularly bad hit was Combined Arms. This was the co-op section of Battlefield 5. Now, before launch, it was touted as a mode that would have endless missions created via a mission generator, and this is stated in quite a few different interviews by DICE around that time. And they also said that it would create dynamic objectives and narratives in order to keep the cooperative experience feeling fresh and challenging. The resulting product had none of that in it, and really, Combined Arms became a complete waste of development time for DICE, and I think it was a complete waste of gameplay time to anyone that has bothered to play it. When it launched in February 2019, three months after Battlefield 5 hit the store shelves, it came with just four different map setups with two missions on each of them, and that gave players only eight different scenarios. That's a far cry from endless missions and a mission generator. Using maps straight out of the multiplayer and setting you up on very basic missions that even the most novice of players could easily complete, Combined Arms felt like an aspect of Battlefield 5 that was almost pushed to one side before the development team remembered that they said it was going to be part of the game and they had to release it in some form. All of that talk about advanced AI and mission generators, all of that disappeared. None of that came to light in the final product and we ended up with this really bland, basic, uninspiring, heartless co-op mode that basically could have been a tutorial system for the game. As I said, a complete waste of development time. Then moving slightly forward into March 2019, arrived one of the most spoken about features of Battlefield 5, the Firestorm Battle Royale mode. 
built by an entirely separate development team for the most part, Criterion Games, Firestorm sought to inject Battlefield 5 with some of that ridiculous BR gaming hype from 2018 and to give it a game mode completely different from the standard multiplayer segment. It was going up against the likes of PUBG, Fortnite, and the very recently released at that time Apex Legends. Now, for the most part, Firestorm has delivered a decent experience down the road of what I'd call classic Battle Royale, being quite similar to PUBG in terms of combat and setup. You jump out of a plane, you use era authentic weapons and vehicles to fight it out against others, and you finish up with either one, two, or four players left standing. Criterion did throw in some really interesting elements into Firestorm to keep it grounded in the Battlefield universe. You could use tanks on the map if you found them in an underground bunker. That was completely different from any other Battle Royale. And capture points, they would spawn across the map. Just like flags in A Round of Conquest, you could capture them and they would spawn extra high value loot. There's even some prototype World War II helicopter spawns across the map. That gave players an extra tool in their arsenal if they were somewhat decent at flying. The map created by Criterion, called Halvoy, is the largest battlefield map ever made, and despite that feat, they'd managed to properly populate it with small towns, villages, plenty of cover, bunkers, outposts, and it spans across two different biomes. You've got grass and snow available. The map is very, very beautiful, and the team deserve credit for the game mode that they've created. However, since its launch, Firestorm support has kind of petered out into nothing. Criterion are now no longer in charge of the project. They handed over the keys to DICE just over a month after it launched, and almost since that point, the mode has been largely underserved. Recently, DICE released a statement that said Firestorm development had been placed on hold whilst the team focused on some of the other issues in the main multiplayer portion of the game, and still now, the mode remains in limbo. This may be because player numbers for the mode aren't extremely big, they might be very, very small, matchmaking wait times regularly exceed 5 minutes even in the most populated areas like Europe and the east coast of the United States. Firestorm is a great game mode, but unfortunately it's just not in the same league when you compare it to other games in the Battle Royale space. Firestorm is a game mode in another game, whereas games like PUBG, Apex and Fortnite, they are their own full games in their own right. That I think had a big bearing over why Firestorm couldn't hold an audience for longer than a month, and also the fact that there was a $60 paywall that you had to get through before you could even play Firestorm. The likes of Fortnite and Apex Legends, they're free to play Battle Royale games. Firestorm is a game mode hidden within a $60 AAA first-person shooter. The Battle Royale space is extremely cutthroat, and unfortunately, Firestorm just couldn't make it last. And now then, let's get into the meat and bones of this one-year review. Let's analyze the multiplayer section of this game, clearly the biggest aspect of any Battlefield game, and oh, what a year it's been for Battlefield 5. From the very beginning, this game has been hit with controversy, and that has pretty much sustained through the first year of support, and it's only now just starting to calm down. After launch, despite that launch being delayed by a month, DICE ended up grappling with several major bugs that impacted the game experience. Players weren't receiving their in-game grind currency properly. That meant they couldn't customize their weapons and vehicles with different specializations or even weapon skins. The networking of the game, that felt kind of wonky. Many players were complaining of hit detection issues. The in-game score counter, that would display damage values greater than 100 for players that you were shooting at, and that would lead to confusion over whether you'd actually killed a player or not. Updates to the main game, they would break other areas of the game, and that led players to questioning the QA process and whether issues that were being identified by QA were actually being fixed or not. There was a push to completely change the gunplay and time to kill that the game launched with just three weeks after the game hit the shelves, completely changing the game from what DICE had spent months advertising. The list goes on. Bugs would arise, be fixed, and then replaced by more bugs. Content was initially very slow to arrive, despite the game being sold as a live service and that players would receive content regularly. It was kind of just one issue after the other for the DICE team. 
Now, I won't go deep into details on all of the major issues. I'm sure there's plenty of videos that you can find on my channel covering that stuff, but there were also casualties along the way as well. The 5v5 competitive game mode that had been rumoured and even advertised for the Chapter 4 trailer, that was cancelled. But the maps for that 5v5 mode, they ended up releasing into the game with other game modes attached to them, so there was some recycling of that content there. The rental server program named Private Games, announced in March and pinned to arrive after summer, was delayed at the 11th hour into the game's fifth chapter, despite DICE having several months to message this unfortunate change was going to happen. Soldier dragging, spoken about during the reveal of the game in May 2018, that was eventually cancelled in early 2019, with DICE citing issues with gameplay pacing and the system not fitting into the overall game flow. During that period, it was really, really difficult to be a fan of Battlefield 5 because the game was just more frustrating than it was actually fun to play. And I don't envy the development team during that period either. I know for a fact that that was not their intention for Battlefield 5 to go that way. It was just the culmination of a series of unfortunate events that the game ended up where it was. But after the summer, things kind of started to change a little bit. Things started to look a little bit upwards. From update 4.2 onwards, the team focused closely on major issues with the game, and this was after the delay to the Alsen Dam map due to graphical issues. The community around the game at that point, they really kind of turned on Battlefield 5, and there was a huge amount of mistrust. And that's when DICE really acknowledged that something had to change. As I said, from update 4.2, DICE worked on fixing those major issues for the game. They streamlined other areas of the game, they redesigned features, and they provided plenty of quality of life updates. Most of the major issues have now been sorted, and the game is in a much better position, with the only mark on their card really being the performance. Overall, Battlefield 5 doesn't run as smoothly as I'd expect it to, and it doesn't run as smoothly as other games out there on the market and it certainly isn't as smooth as its predecessor, Battlefield 1. Now, it's not unplayable by any means, it's just not as good as other games, and that's an area that DICE will need to continue working on. It could be something that could be improved on a patch-by-patch -patch basis to rid the games of some of these hiccups, and then they could be off to the races in the future. But the thing that really got Battlefield 5 moving in the right direction again is the most recent update, Update 5.0, War in the Pacific. This is a massive update that's been in the making for over six months behind the scenes, and it's very clear to see now why DICE was perhaps struggling to improve their game before this update arrived. War in the Pacific is a huge update, it's an overhaul to the entire game. It brings a brand new theatre of war, with maps, weapons, vehicles and factions really upping the content that Battlefield 5 has. The Americans and the Japanese forces, they're here with their iconic weapons, and we've currently got two maps active, Iwo Jima and Pacific Storm, with Wake Island coming in December as well. Now, both of those two active maps, they truly embody what Battlefield 5 is about. We've got that sandbox experience, large, expansive locations filled with all the bells and whistles. We've even got the katana and the flamethrower as pickup weapons that kind of throw you back to the Battlefield 4 days. The completely redesigned audio setup has really stepped up the atmosphere. Tweaks to the gameplay mechanics like sliding, ledge grabbing and rolling, they keep the pace up of the game a little bit higher. The planes in the sky hammering down onto the ground and we've got tanks and infantry now firing back up again. This expansion might as well be a different Battlefield game. The team leading the War in the Pacific update, they took feedback early on from the community around Battlefield 5 and the main goal with the expansion was to deliver some of that classic Battlefield feeling again. And I'd say they've succeeded. With this massive step forward with War in the Pacific in mind then, it does beg the question, why was this not the mindset from the beginning? Why was the Battlefield 5 that we got back in late 2018 so devoid of that epic scale? Why was it missing the rock, paper, scissors gameplay? Why was it so focused on infantry combat? Where was the all-out war, that World War II feeling? Where were the classic World War II locations? What was Battlefield 5 trying to be back in 2018? I guess we're never really truly going to know, but one thing is for certain. The game is now a whole lot better 
because of that Pacific update. And if DICE can take that mentality forward for this game and push into 2020 with more confidence, then Battlefield 5 is in for a great year in 2020. Now, obviously, I think most people are kind of looking for some sort of score from me here. How do I rate Battlefield 5 out of 10? Now, normally I don't like scoring things because everything is subjective. Some people like certain things more than others and therefore they might score things differently. But in the case of Battlefield 5, I think the experience has been so similar for every single player of the game. That really poor start and then a steady climb back towards a good gameplay experience that I think giving it a score is actually easier than it would be for other games. So taking into consideration all aspects, all the way from the launch of the game and everything that's happened right up until now, just as we start year two, I'm going to give Battlefield 5 a 7.5 out of 10. The situation the game found itself in for the first eight or nine months just really wasn't good enough for a AAA game on the market in 2018 and 2019. Patching the game faster than they could perhaps actually manage, the DICE team just kept putting up their own stumbling blocks and they were struggling to get a grip on the game and players didn't take kindly to the product they'd bought into being so buggy and so messy. That really hurt Battlefield 5, and not only Battlefield 5, I think it hurt the entire franchise's reputation. But as I mentioned, after the summer and into the autumn, the game really has changed, and the Pacific update is exactly what this game needed, and it came at almost exactly the right time. In a sense, I think the Pacific update is DICE's way of putting the first year behind them and signalling that they are moving on to something better now. And a year two edition of the game now being sold with completely different cover art signals that to me as well. DICE wants to show that they can do so much better than what Battlefield 5 was when it launched. And I think now they are in a position to show that. The next Battlefield game that won't be releasing until at the earliest April 2021 and likely is going to launch at the end of 2021, probably in October sometime. And that means the team working on Battlefield 5 now has a good year or so to show what they can really do. And they can prove to players who've stuck around and to ones who've left as well that they can come good with Battlefield 5. And I'd say with the Pacific, they're already starting to do that. 7.5 out of 10 is my score. There's still a lot of year one negativity lingering around and the content that was released or wasn't released in some cases wasn't what players wanted to see. Combined Arms was abandoned, Firestorm on hold, competitive support cancelled. All of that doesn't reflect well on Battlefield 5. But the Pacific update, that was a home run for DICE and it was a proper return to form. More performances like that and I've got no doubt that by the end of 2020, Battlefield 5 will be in a very good position indeed. So there you have it. That's my review of Battlefield 5 after one year. Whether you agree with me or whether you think differently, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section. I'd love to read what you're thinking overall about Battlefield 5 at the moment. And a big thanks for watching today and sitting through whatever 18 minutes of, <laughs> 18 minutes of commentary that this video has been. My name is Westy and I'll catch you guys in the next video.